Hello Chapix and welcome to uh, another board games everybody should. Do, do, do. Now, in this video I'm going to be looking at an extension for uh, a board game based on a hit TV series. Now this hit TV series is um, not Star Trek, it's actually called Firefly. Now, if you haven't already seen my video review of Firefly as a single player, I mentioned it again, single player, not a multiplayer, but as a single player game, you can check it out by clicking on the box. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, that expansion is called Breaking Atmo that I'm talking about. So, in a minute, you'll see me go through the cards, but if you want to just hear what I think about the cards, excuse me, you can click on this link just above the box here, and uh, that will take you straight to what I think about these cards in this little packet. Also in this video, at the end of the video, after all of that, I'm going to talk about two games, um, both in the fantasy realm. One of them is a Dungeons and Dragons game, and another one of them is Pathfinder. So if you want to skip straight to that, you can click straight above, I don't know how far the screen goes here, but you can click above that and uh, go straight there and watch that. So I hope you enjoy my video, uh, blah, 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 as you blah, lots and lots and lots. And um, let's go straight to the credits and uh, talk about this breaking atmo. So as I said, there's basically 50 cards, 51 if you can count the rule book. <laughs> yes, yeah, the rule book. You just basically add the cards into the existing deck. So you've got five for each of the locations and five for each of the contacts. That's basically it. Let me show you a bit closely the um, missions and the extra stuff that you get. The cards that you can add to the Cyrus Shipworks include the Encyclopedia here, the Universal Encyclopedia, which gives you um, a bonus of uh, one mechanic skill. And you can, if you do a deal action from any location, you can draw the top three cards of the Misbehaving deck and put them in back in any order, which is quite useful if you know you're going to be naughty, so you can check them out. You also get two of these Alliance Body Armors, which is kind of like the Medic, if your character's wearing them um, and you've got to kill someone off. You can roll a dice to see if they get killed or not. And then there's these two helmsmen which you can add. They're both morale and they're both pilots. And um, they count as if you're solid with Harken. So that's not too bad so you don't have to do any Harken missions. Even though the Harken missions are the easiest ones to complete. So yeah, so there you go. In Silverhold you can buy a round of drinks which is the best in the house. And it will remove all disgruntled tokens from all your crew. There are two vehicle mounted BFGs, which are good because you, if you've got a transport, you add them on, you can add uh, two extras to your fighting skill. And then you have these two uh, people, these uh, well, hill, field, uh, hill folk and a mercenary. Okay, the good thing about this um, Elder Gorman, he's free and he gives you um, lots of speaking, but he won't go on missions which are naughty. Whereas this dude, the head goon, he has good firepower, and if you've got three mercs on your crew, he gives you a plus two on your speech as well. At Persephone, you can have the Gentleman's Dueling Sword, which counts as a, a fancy dud and as a, um, a skill check for uh, fighting, which is quite useful, and you can uh, also add a plus one to it when you do a, a skill test. The Cortex Uplink works kind of like the Encyclopedia. Um, it basically you do a deal action and you can look at the top three uh, jobs of a contact and you can accept and discard as normal. And then you have these two characters, the Fixer and the Accountant. Well, the Fixer is pretty straightforward. He counts as a fake ID and he just gives you a boost in mechanics and speech whereas the Accountant is quite useful because whenever you reach one of your goals you just take 500 squandulies, whatever they're called. At the Space Bazaar, you can get this breaching tool, which is a great little tool to have because uh, whenever you do a salvage ops, you can put one of your con extra contraband on your vessel, which is useful, and it counts as explosive. And there's two of them! I forgot there's two of them. We have two merchants who are very shrewd traders, so they give you a basic speech skill and mechanic skill. And uh, whenever you sell cargo, uh, you get an extra 100 squandulies, spondulies, whatever you want to call them, uh, to uh, each 
piece of cargo that you sell, which is quite useful as well. And my favourite card is the tool playing cards. Um, this is a great card to have uh, because one, it's free, but um, you discard whenever you want and you pay 500 to the bank, you draw five misbehaving cards and if three out of the five cards have the same suit, they're all hearts or spades or whatever, you actually take 1500. I've seen this card used a lot. Um, there was one player who kept going to the same shop and gambling and gambling. He'd, he'd lose a couple of times because there was no um, the misbehaving cards which matched. But when he won, it was um, Shugun. And finally, we come to Regina, and you get these two transports, the Mud Dog ATVs. Um, again, they're a bonus because if you do a smuggling job, you get one extra contraband which you can load on for free. This firearm here is super cool because it's got a sniper, it counts as a sniper rifle and a firearm, and it also can give you a reroll on any of your skill checks for your combat. And this Nadia's gun collection again does the same thing, it gives you two, a fancy duds and a firearm. And again, you can reroll any speech skill test, which is great. And then we have this specialist, just a plain old soldier who counts as a sniper rifle and a, a firearm. He's not allowed to carry anything. That's not fair, is it? Now we come to the contact cards. This is Amandul. And uh, as you can see, it just looks like a normal smuggling job. You go to White Sinon and White Suns and you drop off uh, on Regina. And you need two mechanics to, to get through. But there's this little bonus down here. Basically, for each mechanic uh, skill that you use from your people, from your equipment that you equip to your people, you get a bonus of 400 on top. So basically this job is 800 and you've already used two because you need the two. So that's another 800 on top, so that's 1600. And then any bonuses that you get. And most of these cards are pretty much the same. Go there, misbehave, drop off stuff. Go there, misbehave, drop off stuff. And then you've got your normal bonuses, your companion bonuses on top of everything else. So as you can see, much of the same. The badger jobs, badgers kind of like really knocked off with people and he asks you to go to planets and, and misbehave to get lots of money and you get bonuses upon bonuses for each skill that you have. So fighting skills that you use after misbehaving, you get big bonuses and big pays out. And there's a nice little um, story, a uh, little kind of like subtext here which you can read which which really pays off and makes the mission feel really good. But as you can see, uh, it's pretty much the same as in the base game. Harkin has some really nice easy missions which don't give you much of a payout, but they're all legal, which is the main thing, which is a good way to start the game whenever you're playing. It's nice to do a nice easy mission. This is legal but immoral, so your crew will become disgruntled. And all you got to do is travel to Persephone, Persephone, or Persephone, or Persephone, or movies. Okay, and just get paid. Well, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. Here's another one. Just travel there and just get paid. Simple. But um, if you've got lots of uh, characters and equipment, again, with, with the um, fighting skill, you're going to get paid bucket loads. Again, Patience is a bit like Badger, she's a bit knocked off with people and she asks you to go and do jobs and misbehave in other places and a lot of their needs require uh, firearms and snipers and bits and bobs transport. So you're going to be finding yourself just travelling, being naughty and getting paid lots of money for it, which is kind of nice. It's kind of nice, but very hard to accomplish, especially with the um, misbehaving cards because they're so random sometimes. And finally, the Nishka missions. He gives you lots of money, but you have to misbehave four times. Four times, and you have to have a rep with him as well. That's really hard. But you, again, this is a kind of simple one. It's three times you misbehave, and the pay's not that good. But look at this, 2,000 plus 200 for each gun skill that you have. Misbehave three times just to load up a passenger. Ah. And this one, oh, load up fugitives and then misbehave four times before delivering. Very immoral. Four times you've got to be naughty. Ah, That's risking it. You're going to have to have a good crew to get these missions done. 
So there you go, breaking Atmo. Okay, the first question you're probably asking is, well, Barry, you didn't really like Firefly, so why did you get this? Well, I was hoping that adding these cards into the game would make the game a bit more better, but they don't seem to do anything, in all truth to me. Now, if you loved Firefly, this is a no-brainer. You will go out and buy this. If you thought, like me, it was okay, then take it or leave it, because I'd rather leave it, because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't add anything new, it doesn't, it, it just kind of remixes and, and, and doesn't, you know, and again, there's five new cards and you're adding them to another deck. And so the chances of them coming round are very, very slim. And if you didn't like Firefly whatsoever, um, why are you watching this video? As you saw from the cards, the missions offer you more ways to get money quicker. So if you go on a mission and you've got lots of talking skills and the mission gives you a bonus for each talking skill that you have, you're going to send all those people with the equipment that they've got which gives them a talking skill. And so you're going to come back with a lot of money. And this kind of, if you draw these cards luckily, uh, and you have a lot of these mission cards, then there's 25 of them, so there is a good chance maybe, um, you're going to get a lot of money really quickly. And obviously that will speed up the game because a lot of the game requires money and buying stuff and then paying your, your crew off and things like that. So, in a way it does cut the game down in speed and length just a fraction. The mission cards, are I, I kind of like them better because in the base game there was a lot of transporting cards. So it's just basically you read it and you go, oh you've got to go there to do that and go there to drop it off. Okay. And there was a lot of cards like that. There was not many cards in the base game with flavoured text. Most of these cards have flavoured text. And that's good. That kind of brings in the, the, the theme of Firefly for me a bit. And, but the problem that I have with those cards is that flavoured text is at the bottom and it's kind of written in orange on a brown background. And normally when you're drawing these cards and you're playing the game, you're just looking at where you got to do, where you got to go, and what you got to do. So you don't really read the flavoured text. So if it's been, it's, it's like an Arkham Horror card. You know, you you, you look at it. You look at it. You, the first thing you do is you look at the headline and you read what's going to happen in the situation. It's an event. It's an uh, um, an environment card. And then you think, wait a minute, I've got to start from the bottom see where a portal opens up and then monsters move which is on the bottom and they've got to go up to the clue, where's the clue, and then read the text. And this is a problem. If, if the text had been at the top and had been bright, bold, and told you the story, okay, Badger would like you to do this because he's really knocked with what's his face over there, so go over there, kill a couple of his guys, and then I'll pay you some money. And then you look and you, go, you see, oh, you've got to go there, that would have been better. But as it stands, be it as it may, sorry Tom. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying that this non-game changing um, expansion is a board game expansion that you should probably ignore and uh, just go out and buy this one instead because I'm sure that this will change the game. Right, so what games have I been playing recently? Well, I'm going to talk about two games which are not in my collection and two games that I've only played once and two games which are in the dungeon crawling kind of world of role playing. The first one I want to talk about is Dungeons and Dragons Lords of Waterdeep. Now I played this with a friend who has the expansion, the thingy of, of um, skull thingy. 
Skullport. Skullport, wait, thank you so much. And um, basically the game is a worker placement game. Now worker placement is basically there are X amount of squares on the board and each square lets you do a special thing and you have say three pieces that you can put on each square and only you can do that. So in the case of this game, it's a case of, well there's a tavern there, so if I put my piece there, I can go and recruit some warriors, I can recruit three warriors. Or if I get to the mage guild there, I can recruit two mages. Okay, and then you're, you're basically collecting these um, mages, warriors, thieves, etc. to go on missions. And you have some mission cards which say that you need three warriors, six wizards and a thief to complete this mission and you get these points. Okay, so you're basically just going like there, go there, go there, go there. You can also build buildings which will give money or give a warrior or let people choose which kind of um, personality that they want to take. And that's basically the game. The game goes X amount of rounds. You're collecting money, you're collecting warriors, you're playing cards to, uh, to win points. Yeah, yeah, you can see that I'm not that overly impressed with it. It's nice, everything about it is really nice, especially if you get the upgraded wooden meeple, uh, which look like warriors and wizards, but the game doesn't feel like anything special. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, there's a lot of hype about this game, and uh, I was looking forward to playing it. And I played it, and it was okay. Um, again, I found myself playing the mechanics and not reading the text which is on the card which give you oh this adventure you need to be brave and bold and, and take out the bogeys from the nose of goblin king blah 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 yeah so I wasn't doing any of that I was just like okay what do I need to do next so I think that might be a problem with the game you're, you're thinking okay I want that square and if that square is taken before my turn I'm gonna take that square so um, theme wise it's not there the game is good I'd play it again no problem I love worker placement, I love Agricola, but there you go, I'm giving, my, I'm giving away, I can't do that video now, I can't do a video review of Agricola because I'm giving away my opinion of Agricola. Great. Anyway, so that's Lords of Waterdeep. Not bad, not bad. It's a, it's a nice mechanic, um, it's at the base it's a nice theme, but you don't feel it. And the second game I want to talk about is the Pathfinder card game. Now as the title implies, it is a card game. It is a box, a big box, full of lots of cards and you break these cards down into little categories of types of monsters, types of equipment, um, also uh, your, your characters and your bosses. And the game is basically you choose a character, if you want to be an elf or wizard or whatever, <clears throat> and you get a card, and on the card you've got the stats, there's a lot of stats. And on the card you can also cross off boxes as you level up and gain experience. So uh, you will gain more cards in your deck because your character is a card and a deck of cards, which is the equipment. And your deck of cards will be weapons, potions, medallions, things like that. <clears throat> and of course anything else that you find while doing adventures will go into your deck later on. Now. With your deck, you draw some cards, that's your hand, and you use your hand when you do an encounter. You'll be doing missions, and each mission will have a, a variety of locations put out, and each location will have a deck of cards which is constructed of X amount of weapons, X amount of monsters of certain types, and X amount of potions and things like that. And then you mix all these up with a boss, the boss gets mixed in, and then they get distributed amongst the locations. So you don't know where the boss is. The object of the game is normally to kill the boss. Find him, kill him. So as you're playing, you're choosing a location. Okay, I'm going to go to the pond, or I'm going to go to the park and, and, and play with the kids. And then you take a card from that deck, and if it's a monster, you have to fight it. Now, as I said, there's lots of attributes in this game. So the good thing is some of these monsters come with two attributes, and so you can choose which attribute you wish to attack. So you're sat there with your hand of cards and you're going, okay, I'm going to use that and that and that to attack. And once you've attacked and you've won, the cards go back into your hand and the, the monster's dead and goes back into the box. Same can be said for equipment and extra other things that you can find along your venture. And the game continue like that. 
So, um, how does that sound? How does that sound to you, a card game like that? <clears throat> For me, it was okay. Um, I was playing the French version, so a lot of the text um, I didn't really grasp at first. Um, but um, the game is okay. You, you, it's, it's, it's a puzzle. You sat there with the cards, you're going, oh, what's my best way of getting through this? But at the same time, the game is very random. It's depending on what cards you draw from your deck and what card you draw from the top of the location decks. And it's then just like a case of, okay, I've won this battle. Oh, I've lost this battle. Oh, luckily, he's in the same zone as me. He can help me with that. <clears throat> and once your deck of cards has run out, you lose, you die, you KO'd. But if you win, you're successful, you can go on to the next mission. And any equipment that you've kept, go in your deck. And any stats, that's the good thing. That's the role playing of the game. You build up your character. But as it stands, my first time playing, it was okay. I'd play it again, but um, again, it's not a game which just goes, yes, yes, this is an excellent game, which is what everyone is saying. Um, so there you go. The two games that I played recently, which are based on big dungeon crawling themes. Now, if you want to find out more about these two games, you can always go to the Dice Tower Network and have a look from there for reviews and um, information. Or you can go to Board Game Geek and they have lots and lots of photos and things. Some of the photos I've, I've used here with this video so you can see a bit more of the game. So, there you go. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, I'm now going off to do a concert, so uh, practice is over, and um, I will see you in my next video. Take care. And the second game I wanted to talk about is the PAP. <laughs> and the second game I wanted to talk about is the Pathfinder uh, collectible, uh, collectible, 